Hi there guys and welcome along to the latest and final instalment of series one of Artists in the Spotlight from Mayhem Rockaby Productions here with me, Scotty Barber. Uh, before I introduce this um, this episode with the fantastic Rob Glazebrook, um, I want to say a big thank you to all my guests in the first series and thank you to all the guests that we've got lined up for series two. It's um, I've been blown away by your generosity and your willingness to do this. So we've had Will Collins Nuttall, number one from Fever. We've had Johnny Wildheart and the Blue Lights. We've had Joan Newborn. We've had the Blazing Aces new uh, movie, documentary, whatever you want to call it. And obviously the great Frankie Rydell from the Honkabillies. Um, so a massive thank you to, to you guys uh, for sharing your stories and your careers with us. Um, moving on now to Mr. Brock Glazebrook, who is not only one of my local idols he's also a really good friend of mine who's spent many of our watching gigs um local gigs as well educating me and others of the such like he's been in the playboys he's been in the house rockers he's been in the broadcasters and most recently the mighty lo-fi kings great great guitarist great talented guy and a very interesting person to talk to and i sat down with rob just a few weeks ago and here's his story about all his career and everything rob glazebrook So Rob, thank you very much and welcome along to the Artists in the Spotlight hot seat, um, should we say. Uh, first question, let's just come straight out with it, I hope you're well and everything like that. First question, how did you get into this music? Quite a simple one to start off with. Hi mate. Um, yeah, how did I get into the music? Mm. When I was about 12, 13 years old, I was probably like, I know there's Top of the Pops on and it's got a long time ago because, you know, with the age of the dinosaurs and all this stuff. But it was actually, um, my mum came out with uh, like a Schweppes box full of records from the 1950s, Elvis, Everly Brothers, Roy Orbison, stuff like that. And then she explained to me it was my dad's records that he had uh, when he was alive. And um, he basically was a teddy boy with his brothers and with her brother at the Elephant Castle. They were sort of part of, I think, of the Elephant and Castle gang, that's what it seems to be. And started playing the records and got completely converted before I even got to the end of the box. And that was it, really. Um, the only shame about it was my dad died when I was quite young. I was only three when he died. And uh, he never really saw what those records had done to his uh, eldest son and um, what I do now. Uh, yeah, Rob, very similar in that sort of aspect. I got into this music as well through my father. Um, moves us nicely on to the second question here. What was your first band and uh, how did you end up playing guitar? How did you become a guitarist? How, what was your route to, to doing what you do now? Well, the first band I was in, well, that's a bit of a story because I actually started out, believe it or not, playing clarinet and listening to stuff that my mum used to like me to listen to, which she used to like Benny Goodman, and a bit of Glenn Miller and stuff like that. And I started noticing this drummer who was uh, obviously, well, people that know him would know, uh, Jen Krupa. Loved it. And from then on, I started to learn the drums, and about 14 years old, a friend of the family's, who was actually a jazz drummer, uh, said to my mum, why don't you why don't you bring Rob Brown and I can teach him the drums and I picked it up quite quickly. He said, he tended to think I was a bit of a natural. And from then, when I was quite young, I had some friends uh, that I got to know, um, a guy called Peter Taylor, uh, Nigel Lewis, who ended up being in the Meteors. And we started putting a little band together with a couple of other guys, um, Ricky, was another one who sells records on uh, i think he's in um uh what's the band he's in the mexican band carlos and the bandidos rick rick plays with them and we ended up doing a gig as the southern boys which was and we did sort of uh, hank williams sort of stuff and uh and sort of basic rockabilly and i could just sit there and it hit the brushes or it sticks whichever i wanted to and it was very basic stuff so about six or seven of us in the band so I think all mistakes were covered up and that was the first band I actually ever played in was actually as a drummer. And sorry, the other part of the question really is to do with how I ended up playing guitar. Well, 
I got fed up sitting on the drums and played in a couple of bands and then after a while picked up the acoustic guitar and um, the rest is sort of historic really uh, to sing and play guitar was always a dream and I'm still learning even now after all these years how to do it properly but I think that I've done a fair amount that's been okay over the years. <laughs> This is a, a question we ask, uh, a standard question we ask most of the, the artists we have spoken to so far. Um, who are and what are your musical influences and preferences? Who influenced you? Who are your musical idols and um, influences? Mm, musical heroes and preferences. Um, well, I think as a guitar player, the best thing to do uh, is what I tell even the people I teach sometimes is that I think you need to listen to a lot of guitar players and I tend to put it like it's uh, the hands of a clock so if you think of every number is another guitar player and you're in the middle really and after a while certain guitar players start coming through more and more and more your Scotty Moores your Grady Martins you know Jango Reinhardt Mickey Baker lots of different people and you suddenly start becoming your own style um, and that's really what I think I've done over the years is with my style it's a bit of a jack of all trades master of none type thing but you know I've tried to ensure that I created my own style of guitar playing which um, does get recognized occasionally but obviously um, I do like to do things my way that, not in a selfish way, but uh, if you like, in a humble way. I just uh, like to uh, do stuff and, and try and make something of it rather than just copying it exactly when I'm doing uh, cover versions, for example, with the bands that I'm playing, uh, especially with the house rockers where I do a lot more soloing, uh, which was one of the decision, decision or one of the reasons why I formed the band. And uh, I just got slowly better at it, I think, over a time period. Um, favourite guitar players, as I've said, is round the clock, but one that stands out is actually Pat Hare, who played with uh, Junior Parker. I like the style. I do like playing blues music, as you know, I play in the blues field as well as the rock and roll field. 
Um, and yeah, he was my main influence really when I first heard him on the Sun Records that I bought when, years and years ago. Um, modern guitar players that I liked uh, as time's gone on. I think the one who influenced me the most in that sort of changeover period was actually Jim Carlisle of the Blue Rhythm Boys. I love the way that Jim used to walk around on stage with his guitar. He looked so at ease. And I thought if I could do that one day and sing, it'd be pretty good. This is our Paul Perkins song. Seen you play countless times locally. I've travelled around. I've seen um, you play other parts of England. I've seen on obviously social media you've been obviously seen the Playboys travelling Europe, etc., etc. Um, but what would you say is your personal favourite gig? Is there one that stands out at all? Personal favourite gig. <sighs> to be honest with you, I can't really say hand on heart that there is one that stands out more than any others i've played in front of twenty-five thousand people i've played in front of a man and his dog and sometimes you enjoy that man and the dog gig more than you do the twenty-five thousand because of contact i think the best gigs are the ones where you're close to the audience that you can have a rapport with the audience they look like they're enjoying it they see you enjoying it and then you feed back to them, they feed back to you and everyone's happy. Um, with all the bands I played in, with the Playboys, uh, Roger and the Sarnos, the Scat Cats, the Southern Boys, House Rockers, Broadcasters, the Mighty Lo-Fi Kings now as well, and I've backed so many American artists, over 50 American artists over the years. And did gigs in America, even with America with Larry Don, when we went out there as the Playboys years ago, 30 years ago now, we went out there and we played with Sonny Burgess and Billy Lee Riley and Larry at a gig. It was fantastic. And I've been so lucky that I've been able to, um, or be picked 
and be or be asked to to play guitar for so many American artists. Um, I really enjoyed playing with Daryl Hawkins. I enjoyed playing with Joe Clay, which ended up probably I think it was his last gig in the UK. Uh, Don and Dewey were fun. Big Al Downing was fun. I try and remember the fun ones, but there are there are the, some that are awkward and some that don't turn out as m nice as you'd like them to or as good as you'd like them to. But generally speaking, every gig's great, really, because sometimes, as I say, you can do that small gig in a pub and get absolutely off on it and walk off saying it's 10 out of 10. And you can walk off in front of 10,000 people and say it's 3 out of 10. So in your own um, assessment. But yeah, not really one gig, more a mixture of lots and lots and lots. Yeah, Rob, you've played obviously the lineup with the House Rocks. It hasn't really changed, or well, it's changed a few times. You played with some good artists there. Um, you've also backed American artists, as as, as you know. Um, who is your favourite American artist and, and, and people that you've played with? I think favourite American artist or people to play with. Um, obviously, uh, one of the most favourite times I ever had was when I got to know Larry Don, got him over to England with the help of Willie Jeffrey and got to know him. In fact, he used to stay at my house when he was over here and I'd sort out some gigs for him and he'd tell me that I was his manager in the UK, which was quite a fun thing to do really, saying that you're, and, and Larry wasn't really well known. Honey Bum sort of changed everything. And the fact he was still playing rock and roll in America I got to know his family, I stayed at his house. He was just a special guy. Um, in fact, when I did a, a record thing the other night on Facebook, um, Shelby, his wife, actually joined him uh, in, the, in the audience on the, the Facebook uh, live, live thing. So hence, I've still got that, that um, relationship where we talk on FB and with her sons too, so that's great. Um, Another guy I really like playing with, uh, who's a lot of fun, is Barrance Whitfield. Uh, Barrance is an absolute character. Off stage, he's really kind, he's really humble. He knows how to take over the stage. He knows what he wants from people. And because you know that, you play better because he's creating the excitement and you want to join in, you want to be part of it. Um, on the UK side, uh, one of the fun gigs, I think, was Playboy's. Uh, with Screaming Lord Such, of all people. Uh, Dave Such was uh, a great person off stage, really kind guy, um, very different to what you think he's going to be like. Put him in a, uh, a costume for him to come on and do someone like Jack the Ripper, and he is, is the entertainer. Uh, I'm sure of that. Um, yeah, just lucky that I've had the chance, like I said earlier, to play with so many American artists um, over the, the years that I've been playing guitar and been in bands and stuff and uh, long may it continue as long as I can play and I can keep a band together uh, which is you know what we're doing um, yeah yeah you touched on it there the great Larry Don I mean I managed to get my hands on thankfully to you you gave me a uh, a CD that you backed him when he recorded and played in England, which is fantastic. A great, true rockabilly 50s legend there. Um, as people know, you've played in different sorts of bands. As I touched on at the start, you played with the Playboys, which are more rhythm and blues. You played with the Broadcasters, which are obviously, um, we've got here the um, the vinyl. Um, they're more like Chicago and 1940s, 1950s blues. And obviously the House Rockers, a uh, couple of vinyls here. Uh, flat out rockabilly, um, but what do you say is your favourite musical style? What of these genres do you enjoy the most? Hmm. Music styles. Hmm. Well, considering I've played with different bands and they've all had a sort of niche. Playboys were very much about white label rock and roll, black rock and roll, saxophone led stuff. Um, house rockers, again, hard rock and roll stuff more rockabilly than definitely more than I would have done with the Playboys because of the, the type of music it was. Uh, the broadcasters again picking the blues stuff that I really really like and really wanted to do and try and record and uh, make a statement with and even now with the mighty 
um, Lo-Fi Kings um, with Victor Mac or Little Victor. That's uh, a continuation of that, but having someone else who's playing guitar and singing as well was something different I've not done before. So that was um, that was a decision I made. Um, impossible to answer about the um, types of music exactly because I played in Rochi Nassano's where we literally made up our own style and that was based on sort of skiffle and Mexican music and everything else and um, the gigs wise with all those bands as a like I said before it's seen been so much fun doing stuff and we've even had different lineups in the bands as well um, Playboys must be about 10 different people I think three drummers um, three four saxophone players um, three bass players I think I'm the only person who's kept it in the middle there I suppose, I suppose because the, I'm synonymous with the band I suppose in a way which is just the way it is uh, whether I like it or not like I've been told a few times by friends um, but yeah you try and always as well with bands you always try to have it so that the band members are friends as well because I think that really helps when you have when things are going wrong and you need the band to support you it's no point having someone who's so ego driven he's not really bothered so you know all right egos can be problems in bands but certainly in my experience it tends to be that most of the people go along for the ride have a great time and we do what we do and play all different styles and it keeps me on on the ball as well as far as the guitar is concerned because i'll use different guitars and different amps to create the sounds i really really want for those bands <laughs>
This brings you to the final question. I, I thank you very much for giving up your time to, to speak to me. We've made this in more of a longer feature than just the interview. We've got obviously a lot of live footage here and, and a few tracks that I've recorded live with Mayhem of your performances in recent years. Um, the final question is, it's a recording studio where I recorded my debut album uh, with the Blaze Naces on um, Lubbard's Farm in Rayleigh slash Holbridge. The no recording studio how did you get to record there and what are your thoughts on john that, that obviously runs this great little studio studios and use of and uh, the no studios thing which is i think a lovely name and i have to thank john hannon for thinking that one up as far as recording is concerned with any band that i play with the most important thing is one the room makes you feel like you're in a gig even if it's a bigger studio that you feel that connection with everyone in the studio you're not too far apart you can see each other and i'm very much into live recording so even though there might be eight mics you might get a situation where actually one or two are used because that's all that's needed we had that with a, a couple of tracks we did with the playboys where two mics were used one on vocal and one picking up everything and we turn the other six seven mics off uh, but that was the way we built it or took it down from a basic sound to building out a sound. If you wanted a bit more in it, you just added another mic. Um, the choice of no studios really was to do with John Hannon meeting John when uh, I was asked to do uh, being a film. Um, and we had to play a band in a nightclub. Uh, we needed a saxophone. I got a saxophone player in to cover it and use the lineup of the broadcasters as it was at the time. And um, we got talking and got on very well doing that. And everyone was really happy at what we did. Um, and the idea about no is the other important thing is you've got an engineer who actually is interested in what you're doing rather than just interested in being paid. And unless you have that rapport with that guy, you're never going to get what you really, really want ultimately. And also that engineer's got to have some leeway in what you want. Otherwise, if they stick too rigid to the rules, sometimes the rules are broken. I mean, a lot of rules were made up in the 50s. There was a lot of recording techniques thought of for the first time, like with Les Paul. Even Eddie Cochran was trying different things out. Buddy Holly, you know, these guys were trying different things out. And of course, you needed different types of studios for different types of bands. If you had Joe Turner playing with an orchestra, you needed a big room. But if you could go in gar garage, like you hear on the garage rockabilly being released nowadays, a lot more of it is available than you ever heard before. And um, you know that they just did a, probably two microphones and a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder and they were off. So John Hannon at No is the person that I can relate to on doing that, being a great engineer, knowing lots of technical stuff, but allowing me to be creative do things my way and if there's any time that I may have overstepped the mark I suppose when I did that he would sort of subtly come in the room and say I don't think that works or he'd sort of make a sign like not for me but normally you see him through the window sticking his finger up like that so you just carry on recording and rather than doing one song and stopping we normally do one song and then we stop have a listen to it if it sounds good we'll record five or six on the drop and in fact, the last time I think I was in there with him, I recorded something like 22 songs in four hours. 
and he needed a break, not not us. But by my, by the end of that, it's, your, your voice is a bit hoarse because I don't tend to use earphones that much. Um, I mean, one of the great recordings that we did do as well was in Sweden with Tower Records. And that was a great experience because you were in an environment which was, you could hear exactly what you were recording at the same time. John's is slightly different to that, but it's comfortable. Uh, we turn the lights down, have a beer, and act like we're doing a gig, and that if you make a mistake, we can just do the song again. Whereas in a, in a live gig situation, uh, if you make a mistake, you just carry on. And hopefully nothing blows up while you're doing it as well. But anyway, but you can fix that in the studio as well. Okay. What's called Louis Miss Bobby? <laughs>